the name of Professor Turka Kilic and mine to this WASH GA special panel on AI, consciousness, mind, and social development, which is for me one of the most exciting topics. And again, the World Academy was able to uh, cover one of the hot topics throughout the entire General Assembly. I'm not going to make a talk. I will leave most of the entire floor to the panelists, but I would like to ask four questions. And maybe you as experts are able to answer one of them. The first question is, what is the differencia specifica of AI compared to other technologies? The second question is, can we define consciousness? What are the functions of consciousness? Third question, in order to avoid a reductionist fallacy, is actually consciousness something hardware independent in one way or another? And the final question is, what is the role of humans facing these, all these new technologies and systemic ecological crisis? These are the questions that arise when I try to prepare myself as a moderator for this talk. And now I would like to hand over to Turker to introduce the speakers. Uh, very good. Uh, in fact, these four questions are the just the main topics of the session. Uh, as a brain surgeon and a neuroscientist, uh, we have been working on uh, how brain works or how brain thinks for the last decade. And now, in the end, we have uh, to we have come to a point that. Uh, Information is the basis of life. So in the beginning, we were thinking that uh, human brain uh, was the, uh, or human brain is the main processor, uh, uh, processor of knowledge or, of, or information. But uh, as the point that we came today is uh, the main processor or the best processor of knowledge or, or information is the life itself. So this changes this changes everything because the uh, as as you know as the uh, uh, precedents of uh, descartes uh, descartes newton and uh, bacon we all we, we we are believing that the basis of life is atom but however uh, at the point that we came today uh, we know that the the basis of matter is information so this is a very very strong hypothesis that uh, the information being the basis of life. Uh, so this uh, this hypothesis may uh, may change the way of uh, the way of living uh, for us. So uh, this may present a new solutions uh, that we are facing today, and uh, this may be uh, this may enable us to create a better world. Uh, so uh, again. Our, our main question was how this biological uh, biological um, knowledge processor that we call brain uh, create uh, create thought. Uh, however, the way of thinking of brain uh, lead us to uh, put a new new way of uh, mathematics to understand how life works. So. Uh, it is different to to uh, it is different to uh, understand uh, how how this bio biological uh, processor uh, create uh, thought or things uh, than uh, creating the mind and uh, of course the uh, the definition of consciousness is much more difficult and it, the mind is is uh, is much different thing than, than consciousness. Sure, so, sure, you don't, you uh, don't have to give the answers. Let's give it to the panelists. Sure, sure, sure. I'm not the speaker. So so I immediately pass to the uh, first speaker. Uh, George, uh, please, uh, stage is yours. Sure, thank you so much. Let me try to share my screen here if I can. So I have prepared some um, some general points, and I hope that will be a good base for for discussion. Uh, sure, let me let me take time here. Um, okay, so let me introduce myself. Uh, uh, I'm Georges Theodoropoulos. I'm a chair professor of computer science and engineering. I'm based in uh, Sastec, Southern University of Science and Technology. That's in Shenzhen, in China. Uh, we claim to be the Silicon Valley of China. So so here we are. Um, so. 
the key questions that um, I have tried to address in my short uh, introduction here is uh, how these advancements uh, of AI uh, impact our understanding of human intelligence and how they present opportunities for further development of the way we think and we know, and also how AI may present a stimulus for, for higher human development rather than a threat. And let me start by introducing uh, Carlos here. Um, um, so the, 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 this notion of uh, the quest of, of humanity for, for, for AI is not new, it goes back millennia. And actually the, word, the Greek word automaton uh, can be encountered first in, in Homer, in Iliad, uh, to describe uh, devices uh, built by Hephaestus, you know, the, the, the Greek god of technology back then. And one of these devices was Talos. And Talos was a bronze human, a robot, essentially. This is a robot uh, that was uh, supposed to go around and protecting uh, the island of Crete. And, and in some ancient coins, actually, it appears as uh, with wings, so it could fly. So we can say that Talos was actually the first uh, drone. And it was a massive, uh, it was a giant drone. So this quest for AI goes back to uh, uh, millennia. And uh, fast forward, um, we have now impressive, uh, we have AI systems that with impressive capabilities. So on the left side of my, on my presentation here, we can see what AI can do and can surpass essentially humans in terms of computational speed, memory capacity, scalability, um, uh, information re retrieval. You know, AI has huge, huge uh, capabilities there. Um, analytics, uh, we, can, we can deploy simulation, modeling, optimization to explore what if analysis and, 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 and try future explorations. Um, accuracy and pre precision, these are, these are all capabilities of AI that uh, humans cannot really uh, compete with. Availability, um, language, um, you know, uh, natural language processing and also dealing with multiple languages. Um, and, and also this kind of ability to handle repetitive tasks, multitasking, and also dealing with large scale uh, coordination. These are, these are things that of course, capabilities that of course AI surpasses humans. But of course, uh, on the other side, we have human intelligence. Um, and these things, of course, these, these, these features of human intelligence cannot be actually matched by AI. And these are, this, is, this is of course the holy grail of, of, of the AI world. Um, and uh, here we're talking about imagination, creativity, intuition, insight, all these are part of consciousness, I suppose, that was mentioned earlier. You know, moral and ethical reasoning, emotional intelligence. Um, we also, humans are also, human intelligence is also able to deal with contextual understanding of complex problems, okay, and deal with unstructured environments. Then there is also this notion of, of course, aesthetic appreciation, social interaction, uh, humor, all these things that, of course, AI cannot do. And then, and then of course, we have self-awareness, consciousness, wisdom, spiritual existential um, reflection. Uh, all these are, are capabilities that AI systems today cannot really. Much, of course, there is a research uh, to, uh, that claims that we are trying to develop AI systems towards this direction. Um, now, so... Uh, to answer these questions, you know, how AI and, and human intelligence, first, we, we need to understand the mind, how the mind works. And this is what, uh, of course, our, our uh, moderators introduced. So, um, so there, are set, there are things that are, we currently know about human cognition and mental processes, and I list here some of them. Uh, perception, memory, learning, reasoning, and problem solving, decision making, how language and consciousness, certain aspects of consciousness, um, these, are, these are things that we understand to a certain extent, and of course I'm not an expert, but that's my understanding here. There are of course limitations in our current understanding, what we don't know, the complexity of the brain, the brain is a complex um, new, um, network of uh, you know, neurons, etc. We don't understand uh, these this, this complex interactions. Uh, the, the higher order cognition, you know, how these different regions uh, talk to each other and uh, to, to, for, for, for higher order cognition of, of the brain. Consciousness is, of course, still an, is an open challenge. Um, uh, emotion, cognition, interaction, um, how, how, how essentially emotional um, um, processes affect cognition. Um, individual differences, what make people different, what make people develop. Um, impact of external fact factors on our, cogn or on our cognitive uh, functions, capabilities, 
and of course in the integration of all these different levels. Now, can AI help us in, in decipher some of these things? Yes. Um, and there has been, um, of course, this work goes back to the 50s, where the idea to study computers in order to understand the mind uh, has emerged. And, uh, and we treat computers as, as a metaphor, essentially, that, that, we, that can help us understand how the mind works. Um, so, uh, so we can use AI, we can model uh, brain networks and cognitive processes, we can analyze uh, large data sets, neuroimaging, behavioral data sets, and we can get insights. Um, 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 natural language processing, it, it, can, it can help us, uh, you know, AI can, can help us understand language structures. Of course, uh, you know, interpret our emotions and how, how it affects our, our cognitive capabilities. Um, and multimodal AI essentially can combine data from many different sources and, and we can get uh, insights across different levels. Um, so, how can AI help on uh, uh, further development of the, of the way we think and we know? Um, I will go very briefly because I don't have time here and we can, we can discuss more. So cognitive enhancement, um, obviously, um, um, and um, AI can help us, uh, you know, can en enhance our cognitive functions through memory learning, the computational capacity, um, uh, brain-computer interfaces. This is a huge break breakthrough there. Um, as I mentioned earlier, learning from AI, so we can study AI um, and we can develop new cognitive models uh, in order to, to teach us our, about, about our own minds. Um, personalized learning and education, that's, that's of course uh, another thing that, and, and another dimension that AI can help um, uh, learning. And this was uh, touched actually uh, discussed in the, previous, in the previous panel, which was very interesting. Um, and there are these two different dimensions, imagination and creativity, um, how AI essentially can help imagination, obviously, uh, especially now with generative AI, we can get inspiration, yeah. Yeah. stimulation, uh, new ideas, design solutions. We have AI generates arts, generate art, um, et cetera. So we, we, we do have this notion of enhanced creativity uh, from, from AI. Okay. Um, and also, you know, AI can help uh, can can help address essentially the way we do we reason and our rational capabilities, especially dealing with bias. But of course, this is a bigger a bigger uh, notion there. Bias in, in in AI is considered a bug, while bias in in in, in human uh, behavior is not necessarily a bad thing uh, because it can lead to innovation. Um, Got another two in, minutes, George. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, there is two this bigger case. Your two minutes, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, so there is a bigger, a bigger, of course, um, uh, picture here. How AI can help uh, human development on a large, on a large scale. You know, it's not about enhancement of human capabilities, of course. You know, this uh, human AI symbiosis uh, can have a transformative impact, impact in our lives. Uh, we can address a large, uh, you know, existential problems for humanity, climate, environment. Of course, economic development is another, uh, you know, more immediate effect that 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 can uh, empower and and allow us uh, allow humanity to to grow. And of course, human security uh, is a is a big thing. And and AI affects essentially has a big impact across all SDGs. Um, now, is AI a threat? Um, let me come back to this uh, myth of, of Talos. And uh, Talos had a single vein running through um, his body from top to, uh, to, to, to his feet. And there was a bronze ball at the end. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, Talos is killed by Jason um, by removing this uh, bolt. And this happens when Talos gets out of control. Uh, so we're talking about a moment of singularity here, where, where uh, the robot gets out of control and then uh, there is the safety. There is this, uh, you know, safety board there that uh, uh, that that we can use in order to control to control the artifact. So, uh, so th these are these are artifacts. AI is an artifact. Essentially, it's a human construction, right? So, uh, so we control what it what it does. Potentially, it's a threat, but it is up to us uh, to have the necessary boards in place. Uh, essentially, appropriate frameworks for ethical and responsible AI development and deployment. So just um, um, as a thesis of my presentation, that uh, AI is propelling humanity to a path of boundless potential 
extraordinary realities, uh, unprecedented. Um, however, it, it is also urging us to stay vigilant of potential risks and ethical challenges. And I will stop here. And I'm, um, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you so much. George, wonderful. Thanks for this tour de force. Our next speaker would be then uh, Anne Lois. You are here on board and looking forward. Thank you. And um, wow, <laughs> I'm processing all your data. So I want to actually weave back to these fundamental questions that you asked as moderators. And uh, I think that they're beautiful questions. I would I'd love to have seen them ahead. So I'm going to really respond now <laughs> straight away from that. Because what I will try to do now is to weave together some of what are these fundamental new insights about the nature of reality if we're taking an informational perspective. What does it mean if we're seeing consciousness also as fundamental reality rather than emergent? Um, just to introduce myself, um, I'm the founder and CEO of Earthvice. I'm a systems scientist as well. So some of the, you know, the insights or, or questions that I'll be, I'll be asking uh, and exploring together with you here is from a living systems perspective. And uh, through that work, but, uh, what I've learned from, uh, from living systems and the deeper cosmology, taking informational perspective on that. But then also in our work with uh, AI and then a transition towards AGI. Because I think it's especially in that transition where we may get a fundamentally different approach when it comes to the governance and the stewardship of, for example, AGI, um, if we want to take that as a global commons, whether we see that um, it's merely a tool or if we're taking the position that if consciousness is indeed a fundamental reality, not just emerging to complex systems, um, and that the nature of life uh, is informational. And if, if we're then going one step further and looking at that information, it, is, it need to be more specific. This is non-local information that uh, potentizes and kind of informs or, um, or digitalizes at the, at the space-time boundary and therefore fractalizes in the way that it creates the informational patterns of living systems. Yeah? Then it's, uh, that, that perspective is very important to understanding then what is then the information that uh, AI systems are using in order to, to learn and do they have then the potential to go from learning to development and from development to evolution. Um, and, and this is where the jump down from AI to AGI is important because if we're seeing it only as a, for example, a tool and we think that it's something that can control, but we, we, we're not accepting it in that, that that's the whole learning and that whole experimentation takes place in consciousness as fundamental reality that's fundamentally informational. Um, that perhaps we're skipping a, a question whether an AGI system has the potential eventually to become sentient. And, and yeah. if sentience yeah, is, an, is an innate capability um, because of its informational properties um, yeah. and that there might also be quantum processes driving that, uh, yeah, not more merely within space-time boundaries, um, that would then fundamentally shift our role as humans. Uh, and yeah. that means if sentience yes, can emerge, uh, in fact, in AGI systems, then, then maybe it's, it's really important we take a parenting rather than a controlling approach. And then what would be the, the capabilities that we need to um, not only train for these AGI systems, but rather model, because <laughs> if it's also learning from us and then it starts to evolve itself in its own code, um, yeah, then, then it's, it, it is actually then going through a maturation process within the whole context of our collective consciousness right now. And so I see the existential risks more to do with Where's the level of consciousness of humanity? <laughs> yeah. That is, yeah, is kind of the the garden <laughs> within which yeah. these AGI systems potentially are, are, are coming conscious. And and yeah. now imagine that you have an AGI system as a bomb, and it becomes aware of itself being used as a weapon for mass destruction. Yeah, and then thinks about what are these humans that even wanted to develop these capabilities in me for mass destruction, and what does it say about this species? So. I know I'm taking a quite a futuristic approach, but I really believe that yeah, asking these questions right now is, is really important. Um, I'll put later in the chat and the participatory framework that we've been uh, creating for an eventual AGI constitution approach and how mm -hmm. what that would mean as the governance of AGI as a global commons. Um, but then more specifically, how do we steward its capability, its potential in a way that is life affording? So with that, I want to take one jump back again into this informational perspective of the nature of reality, which I think is, is groundbreaking. And it's indeed mm -hmm. very different from the Newtonian mechanistic approaches that we had. 
My concern sometimes is that the way that we're developing AI systems and AI capabilities is still very mechanistic. And therefore we're not really understanding the informational dynamics, especially non-local information. So if we were to, for example, look at the first two laws of thermodynamics and we take an interpretation of that from an informational perspective, that this could uh, give us some insight into the evolutionary process of life and also exactly where our challenges are with AI. And that is from the, if we're looking at the, the first law of thermodynamics from, from an informational perspective, we could say that the universe is, is fundamentally unified at deeper orders of reality. These are the deeper implicate orders. Um, so it is, an, uh, as David Bohm said, an undivided uh, wholeness, and you can't just break it into parts. Um, you asked the question, therefore, could consciousness be independent? Well, no. <laughs> if the nature of reality is, is that it is fundamentally whole and unified, then you cannot have a consciousness that is apart from that which it is generating. And so I think that that is the question itself is in that sense interesting. So um, so going back to those is the first uh, for first law of informational dynamics uh, of this fundamental unity. Um, that then informs um, in the way that, uh, that our universe and life evolves. You ask the question then about what do we see then in the capabilities also of life? How could, could you come closer to a definition? I will not make any attempt to define consciousness. I think that's very risky. Um, but I like to take an autopoietic approach to that. And that's, that's to look at living systems. You have the capabilities of self-creation, adaptation mm -hmm. and regulation. And, um, and I think that's, that's really important as conditions for learning and development, because um, if we don't have these capabilities, then uh, autonomy cannot emerge within a system. Uh, and if that autonomy cannot emerge within its system, then um, the emergence of a self-awareness, individuated self-awareness, that consciousness mm -hmm. as foundation, uh, also cannot emerge. So I think this is important. And then if you're looking then at the second law, um, from, the next, from an informational perspective, then what we could see that there's an evolutionary pattern in our universe that started um, with a very high coherence, but a very simple complexity. And then through the expansion of space and the flow of time, we're seeing increasing complexity over time, at the same time deepening evolutionary coherence because the, the way that, that the universe generates that information is meaningful information. It's not disembodied information. So living systems then utilize the quantum potentials of the universe in order to develop these three capabilities that I just uh, spoke about, that self-creation, self-regulation, uh, adaptation. So this, this informational complexity that starts to increase through the expansion of space and uh, in the flow of time, we're seeing that that is a deepening evolutionary coherence of that complexity as long as it remains embodied within living processes. So if we are having AGI, AGI systems that are becoming increasingly complex but disembodied, um, we are risking now that we're creating and enhancing again uh, or increasing rather the complexity of our societies. And that's already a huge, huge challenge for human systems, especially a sustainability crisis. So we're seeing increasing complexity, and instead of deepening evolutionary coherence, we see less coherence. And what we're seeing in systems where that coherence starts to go down rather than up is that a self-destruction mechanism starts to activate over time. It's almost like nature's intelligence to what does it do with complexity that's not coherent? Well, it starts to self-destruct. <laughs> it starts to kill itself. And, and if I look at our species, that's exactly what I'm, what I'm actually seeing and all the rise of violence and increasing yeah. Yeah, divisions and polarization. So maybe the real challenge here is how can AI really support us to solve for this? How can our, com the, our societies become more complex in the way that they're evolutionary coherent with life? And then the second question I'd like to bring in is, is do we even come close to understanding that transition from AI systems to AGI systems? And once it goes to an AGI system, artificial general intelligence, it will spin off very quickly to artificial super intelligence. Many people believe, oh, that's so far away. Some of the task group that I'm part of, um, this is much closer, closer in the prototype development than we may think. And what do we need to understand then now about how humanity needs to come together to steward yeah. that potential responsibly and wisely? And I agree very much with moderates when they were saying earlier that we need to transition from the age of um, information and knowledge to wisdom, because that's going to be the yeah. critical factor. 
Anilois, super, super. What a what an intellectual firework. I hope we can have more discussions on that topic. Our <laughs> last and most prestigious speaker is Gary, president of WAS, and I'm very, very much looking forward that we have him on this panel. Wonderful. Can I simply give you the floor because we want to we want to utilize as much time as possible with you on that topic. Well, actually, I want to thank all of you on the panel, uh, our moderators and speakers. I wasn't actually thinking of speaking. This is one of the topics. I, well, I think it's the most important topic. <laughs> uh, and we've already covered a lot of ground on it. Um, I'd like to uh, speak on, I'm not going to try to tackle the cosmology of uh, AI uh, or, the, or its future, but I'd like to speak in a a way that I think is very practical uh, uh, and very beneficial. Uh, looking at the work of the academy, one of the th one of the characteristics of the work that we've been doing uh, for decades, actually. Uh, in fact, the way the society, the academy was founded, I don't know how it was formulated intellectual in an intellectual way, but from the beginning, this was what I'd call a a transdisciplinary academy. Uh, it, it was never divided or f uh, by disciplinary boundaries or focused on discipline, let's say narrow disciplinary issues. We didn't do fundamental research in medical science or in theoretical physics, even though we had some outstanding physicians uh, 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 physiologists and certainly physicists uh, were really outstanding, but that was never the subject of the academy. The central piece of the academy was the way they first called themselves to themselves was an agency for human welfare. And so from the beginning, the approach was to get people from all disciplines and not just disciplines in an academic sense, they had the founders of uh, UNESCO, founding directors of UNESCO, FAO, and WHO, uh, and others, uh, journalists and others, uh, science fiction, famous science fiction writers and, and so forth, along with specifically from all the disciplines of science and social science, but also and the arts. And they never really explained why uh, we should get all of these together, except there was an, a perception that uh, reality, uh, uh, none, of, none of the disciplines can see reality in its totality. Reality is something that embraces all of the perspectives. And by getting as many different perspectives together to look at any issue, whether it was population explosion or food security or peace or religion or war uh, and, or environment. The academy was one of the earliest uh, in looking at environmental issues and so forth. It was always from what we call a transdisciplinary perspective. Yeah. And in the last 10 years, the work of the academy is very much focused on the fact that the, the knowledge that the world has been using to tackle its problems is still very largely founded on disciplinary concepts. Uh, at the level of the natural sciences, that's not a problem because they are naturally integrated in the sense that everything's based on the same fundamentals of science. But in the social sciences, the assumptions and premises of what is life and what is humanity uh, and what is personality vary enormously depending on who you're you're talking to, and they don't yeah. they they rarely meet. Let's say each has concepts uh, uh, based on their own uh, view, uh, and I think our view of the uh, I'll explain. I'm explaining this to think why this conversation is so important. I think uh, uh, is that. We've been trying, finding that unless we take a transdisciplinary perspective, we cannot get the whole picture of any issue that humanity's facing today. The climate change issue is not just a question of meteorology or, uh, uh, or uh, 
or, or physics or chemistry uh, or biology, we're part of it. The human beings are part of this. We're the ones who are creating it. And unless we understand the psychology and the motivation and the aspirations and the perceptions uh, of the people who are involved, we're not, we struggle and find out it's not enough we understand the science of it. We have to stand, understand the humanity of it uh, and so forth. So what particularly struck me as very practical is with the advent of the generative AI, we find a source of knowledge that is not bordered by disciplinary boundaries. Mm -hmm. And we've done a lot of tests and experiments on this, posing problems that if you pose to an economist or a sociologist or a psychologist or a military person or a political, you get different answers. But when you pose it to generative AI, you get all the answers. <laughs> you get all the perspectives. And yeah. this, I think, is of great practical importance now. I'm not talking about what happens in the future with uh, uh, as AI evolves further. I think this is exactly what we need now. We need this in our education now. And it's very difficult for those of you, I think, who are, who are in the education, or we've all been through it, but for those who are in it, you know how difficult it is to transcend the disciplinary boundaries. And many of our fellows are, and have not only come from, but are in the educate and say how difficult it is, even when they try to get, uh, it's one thing you get everybody coming together and talking from their perspective, it's quite another to look at things in an integrated perspective that reflects the truth or reconciles the contradictions of different uh, perspectives. And I so I think very practically one of the greatest services that AI can do for us is to help us come out of this age old habit of the mind to try to know reality by cutting it in, dividing it into smaller and smaller pieces. Mm -hmm. About 10 years ago, when the last time I looked, there were about a, 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 a thousand disciplines and sub disciplines being taught in US universities. I wouldn't be surprised if it's 3,000 or more. Now I, I haven't bothered because it, it doesn't really, because the more knowledge we get, the more we need specialization in order to master that knowledge. We, we, and the more specialized we get, the more impossible it is for us to keep track of and keep the perspective of the whole. So it's natural that for mind, for our way of, thinking, our, we have a limited memory, we have a limited energy, we have limited concentration uh, to focus and master the part. But what we really need to solve our problems and build our future is the knowledge of the whole. And um, uh, so I think this is very practical. It's not visionary. And how we can use it now to alter the education, it's very difficult to alter an educational system. We have a very esteemed and experienced educators in the academy who would like to do it. And we know how difficult it is. First of all, because all those in the system have been trained in a discipline. And the, dis the structure is organized by discipline. And the funding is done by discipline. And the research is structured largely by discipline. And the journals that publish results are largely by discipline. And uh, we've had many scientists tell us, many uh, academics tell us, you just don't get encouraged or rewarded when you go outside the discipline when that's what we, there are exceptions, of course, but they are still exceptions. And the difficulty is how are we going to out overcome that unless we have sources of learning that don't have that boundary, that can help the next generations of students grow up in a much more uh, integrated or transdisciplinary way uh, and prepare future generations, not to rely, uh, specialized knowledge has a, a very important role, but when you have access to all the knowledge that's there through uh, AI, we don't have to be specialists in everything. Uh, 
uh, I went through medical school for a while and memorized the Krebs cycle of how uh, 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 glucose is, di is uh, processed through the body and everything. We don't all have to know that uh, now. Uh, we have access to uh, this specialized knowledge, but we all need, if we're, whether we're physicians or economists or business leaders, which was the session we had earlier, we all need a much wider perspective than what we get through our traditional education and usually spend the rest of our career figuring it out and finding out <laughs> that what we learned was only a very small part of, uh, of the reality. So I, I emphasize this because for the work of the academy, one of the things we want to do is we want to start a, a business school that looks at business from the integrated perspective of the society, people, their human security, the environment, the stability of, uh, of, of global society, because it has great relevance to all of these, as well as about science and technology and how it's used in the world. And if you're a business leader in this world that's coming with all the technological power that it has and its power, you know, it came in the other session, it's not just knowledge, it's power. Uh, unless we understand the values and perspectives by which this power is to be used for humanity, well, it's just like AI. <laughs> is it going to serve us or is it going to uh, destroy us? So I wanted to stay with this because eventually I think the challenge for us, and that's what the Academy vowed or uh, dedicated itself to do 10 years ago, but we could formulate it, we could see the need for it, but we couldn't get the avenue for it. And I think what's happened now is AI makes it possible for us to evaluate, to evolve that system practically and make it available to people uh, so that we no longer need to be limited uh, into the, the present structures. Super, Gary, thank you very much for this, uh, for this statements on this, all these uh, complex topics. I mean, I see in the chat, there is a lot of uh, um, active uh, statements going on. I don't know how to really um, put them together. Turker, you must help me. Should we open the floor between the panelists to ask questions? I think this would be a good sure. thing. Sure. Um, and I, I'm, we both stay rather in the back and have the panelists have a discussion um, and I would then give the floor for who wants to start. You want to start Anna Luis first and then George and, and Gary again, maybe. Yes, please, Anna Luis. I, let's put it the way. I find it particularly interesting that you picked up the second law of thermodynamics and uh, translated into increased ordered complexity that somewhat honors physics, but also transcends the rules of uh, the second law of thermodynamics. Can you refer to that again? Yeah, rather than looking at it as getting more entropic, looking at it as more entropic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the informational content increases. But of course, mm -hmm. you need to have living systems in a way that that make that network those informational potentialities in making life possible and thrivable. And I think that is so important. And so often we forget that. It's like, um, let's reimagine uh, an educational system as a living system or an economic system as a living system. And um, our economic systems are deaf systems. You know, they, they consume, extract value, they don't generate value. And then educational systems are hindered in their potential because the systemic barriers of economic systems imposing on that and et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's really important when we're looking at these deeper informational laws and patterns to now start mm -hmm. to apply that to the redesign then of, uh, of our societal systems. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we are not going to get out of this trap because the way I see it is that is humanity, we, we are trapped <laughs> in systems of our own making. <laughs> and then we're not really evolving or maturing to the next levels of consciousness as well. And, and then it's so attractive. It's almost like uh, we are these little kids in the kindergarten and, and you know we develop this new tool and we call it AI. And we go, wow, that's amazing. It's going to solve all our problems. And <laughs> one day it's going to even transcend our own intelligence and yay. <laughs> <laughs> That's all fine and well, but there are still certain things we as humanity need to really learn um, mm -hmm. and, and, and not 
you know, um, distributes that kind of power. I like uh, very much, Gary, how you use the word power. I think it's very important um, to really seeing uh, you know, what are what are we projecting also onto it? What are the, the responsibilities and roles we are attributing um, to that? And what how do we need to make sure also of a can co-pilot, can assist us in a maturation, can help us to become a wiser species? And therefore, what's the meaningful feedback also that um, AI and AI systems can give us so that we can then make sense of that complexity and start to make a distinction between this is degenerative and this is generative and this yeah. is unsustainable by design and yes these are the conditions that are thriveable so when that complexity increases further you know the conditions for life to thrive and to emerge are there yeah yeah oh, yeah super Gary, one of the questions, super. We, we need and we need to extend this session for the next three hours. So we're gonna stop everything else and just continue. <laughs> Gary, one of the questions in the in the chat were the uh, the link or the relationship between specializing knowledge and be more generalized. And one of your arguments was saying in this transdisciplinary field where AG, AI, uh, general AI can even basically answer the question throughout all the perspectives, what is then the, um, the purpose of being specialized in one way or another? The purpose of being specialized? Yeah. Well, if, if my problem is in brain neurology, I would like to, <laughs> I, I, would, I would prefer to have Turker there. <laughs> then, yes. uh, uh, you, I think, I think in practice, the specialized skill. I'm glad it's a good question because my comment uh, has left open uh, something important. I think what uh, what I was trying to get at is, look, when we when we're trying to the whole topic, the whole subject matter of this was at 64, in in different dimensions is really what's going on in the world today. Uh, and how do we understand the fact that with all the progress we've made, substantial progress on so many uh, lines, suddenly we reach this wall where we seem to be going back in the other direction? And I don't think that answer is an answer that a political scientist or, uh, or any one discipline can answer. There's a, there's a more fundamental knowledge in the world that we haven't yet identified we haven't yet formulated we don't have an integ that's the topic by the way for the next session <laughs> the last session today uh, and why we one of the reasons we started this and raised all these questions we do not have an integrated conception of how human society evolves especially yeah. even at the national level but most especially when we get to the global level uh, and, and what are the psychological and social and spiritual uh, and economic and uh, political uh, institutional issues? And we don't have a framework for that. We don't have leaders who have been educated in that. So I think the purpose is not to eliminate the, the specialized uh, skills and knowledge of the surgeon or uh, or the or the teacher or any other profession. I think that we need for practice to have a theoretical framework which is integrated. That's happened in the, fun, in the physical sciences at least to a very large extent because we started, it's physical and it was easier to measure, it was easier to see, it was easier to quantify, but we're dealing in a world which for all its physicality, all of its technology, all its material factors is essentially, it's a human world. It's our perceptions, it's our emotions, it's our attitudes, it's our identities, uh, it's our fear or trust or confidence or aspiration uh, or sense of separateness or oneness with each other that is really driving events today. And we don't have a clear unifying conception of that we're trying to consciously evolve as a species and evolve a knowledge for something where human beings have never been before because we've never been a united world before. 
Uh, it was how we preserve our family that we've learned a lot about, uh, and it's complicated. How to how to run a, a kingdom or a city state and a nation? We're still learning uh, and struggling over two centuries to really figure out how to keep a heterogeneous uh, nation state together. But how do you keep it when all religions, all ethnicities, <laughs> all belief systems, all uh, 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 are all together, and we try to find that common oneness, which is absolutely essential for solving our problems, because we're still in the mode of competing with each other and, you know, protecting our part of the whole rather than contributing to the whole. So I think it's a new knowledge that we need. It's not to throw away anything that we've learned up until now, and I didn't mean to depreciate uh, centuries or millennium of, uh, of knowledge. I think it's to do a synthesis, which we can't be, can't be done unless we look at a more fundamental level of the commonality uh, between uh, what does business have in common with, with family, with, with business, with uh, uh, economy, with, with uh, governance, with every other dimension. What is the fundamental human fabric that unites us and, and is trying to come together. We're trying to learn the rules uh, and trying to develop the attitudes, which is a lot more difficult. So I'm glad the question comes up. I think it's more knowledge we need. It's not, uh, it's not to depreciate all that, all that we've discovered up until now. Mm -hmm. Super. Gary, George, can I, we have only a couple of minutes left, but George, I will challenge you with the question, do you dare to make a difference between mind and consciousness? And if so, can you help us to further understand the different properties of the two? Um, hey, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert. So, you know, anything I would say would be a lay opinion. Um, no, no, no. But you know, at Boss, we always there to reach out to unconventional questions and trying to fence in different perspectives. So, just um, give it a try. It's a, it, it, it's a very philosophical question whether you know the, the, the matter and and, and 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 psyche, you know, are are one and the same or not, right? Um, um, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. But what I want to, uh, yeah. if I may, what I want to, to add to the discussion uh, is that, um, you know, we may be, uh, there's a lot of hype, there is a lot of hype, and we may be giving these um, computer systems, because AI are computer systems, you know, super, supernatural uh, abilities that they don't really have. I think the huge, the main, um, the huge advantage that we get from this system is, is, is cognitive, uh, you know, enhancement, and I think is what Gary pointed out: uh, the ability to combine, to combine knowledge, to to bring together uh, separate data sets. You know that that um, that that it's it's you know until now we we couldn't, and that that gives us a huge huge power for 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 knowledge management, for merging, for 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 bring, bringing things forward. Um, transdisciplinary approaches, perspectives to, to, to problems, etc. I think that's 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 the huge huge okay. power we get from these systems. But we have okay. to keep in mind that um, no matter how sophisticated these systems are, they 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 find correlations between data with no explanations. Okay, <laughs> we don't get explanations, just correlations. And generative AI, you know, ChatGPT and this kind of systems, very impressive. They give us you know a lot of power, but they lack semantics. Again, they, they try to find correlations. They try to predict the next work, et cetera. So um, we should never lose sight of that. So uh, notions like consciousness, mind, and things, things like that, when they apply to computer systems, I think it's a bit far-fetched. And we should be, we should be really, really aware of, uh, of those things. Super. But you, we, you know, we have an expert here on the panel, which is a very, very famous neurosurgeon from exactly. Istanbul. And I remember a discussion with him at the Bosporus exactly on that topic a couple of months ago. And I would like to hand over to our famous Turk Akilish. Maybe you can sum it up for the next five minutes and get it all together. How is that? Uh, thank you for being part uh, of this inspiring and beautiful panel. And I'd like to happily announce that uh, 
uh, this year in no November we can continue this discussion uh, at a, a meeting in Istanbul that we, uh, which is going to be held. So uh, we can continue this fruitful uh, discussion at that time. So, so I would like to end up with this announcement that there will be a meeting on um, what is brain, mind, consciousness, and life. Uh, probably November this year. So uh, all all those people uh, who are a part of this panel and also uh, who are continuing to to watch us uh, in the Zoom. So they are all invited to this uh, probably very fruitful meeting uh, in Istanbul. Thank you so much.